afternoon, everyone. Uh, post lunch session. Uh, so uh, my talk today is based on practice, bringing a bit of theory in, um, more some reflections, and probably setting a direction of work for the future. So to begin with, um, just wanted to start off with this. When you think about my own view of accessibility, uh, my own understanding of it, when I began work in this field almost 20 years ago, very much at the technical end of this spectrum, um, it's the relationship, though, between technology and pedagogy that really hooks me in to working on my education. Uh, and that applies not just to accessibility, but all aspects. When we think about resources or multimedia or forms of interaction or teaching or even the students that have on these programmes. Now, I'm a member of the Association for Learning Technology and I have been for a very long time. And one of their core principles is to look at the interplay between technology and learning and teaching practice. So that started me thinking about whether we can apply this type of lens to accessibility too. Now, I'm not sure whether this is a spectrum uh, or perhaps it's just a representation of the interconnectedness between those two angles. But I also know, well, I say no, how can I really know that? I really, really believe, we should say, that these are not intended to be mutually exclusive. There is a line between them, there is a connection, there is a dependency between these two points of view. So if we, we have a foray now into sort of some of the standards and principles that underpin digital accessibility, starting from this more technical point of view, uh, the WCAG, or I'll call them WACAG guidance, um, are these internationally recognised standards. And there's recognition that these guidelines, and I quote, make content more accessible to a wider range of people with disabilities, but will not address every user need. They are, however, based on four principles. And just to give some examples of what these principles mean, first of all, to be perceivable. So that's having text alternatives to uh, alternative media. <clears throat> to be operable. So for example, if using keyboard only navigation, to be understandable in terms of language and consistency of navigation, and to be robust. And that's compatible with devices and assistive tools. Now, this is a technical specification. Uh, it's described as success criteria, uh, written as testable statements. So it's also accompanied by even more technical guidance and standards in the WAI ARIA guidance for web applications. So it's a real technical way of looking at um, accessibility in online education. Now, the Universal Design for Learning, CAST, is described as framework for uh, improving and optimizing teaching and learning for all people based on scientific insights into how humans learn. And the presentation that was in here before lunch draw upon that science of learning aspect to inform the learning design. So UDL is based on uh, universal design for learning. UDL is based on three core principles, providing multiple means of engagement, multiple means of representation, and multiple means of action and expression. And these are otherwise described as the what the what of the right order, the why, the what, and the how of learning. There are some parallels with the WACA guidance around minimizing distractions, navigation, alternatives for certain media, compatibility with assistive tech, as well as language and instruction. But the guidance of UDL goes further into the design of learning, looking at self regulation, scaffolding knowledge, means of expression and communication. This is nicely into inclusive learning design. And Werner Rossi's recent book provides a conceptual framework and a transferable application for practice. The roots to shoots approach that Rossi explains is a holistic, comprehensive way of designing learning to support every student to thrive. You see some of the patterns of language that are coming through, even from the technical all the way through to the pedagogical interpretations. Now, these roots of the approach are very value-based. It's a values-driven approach <clears throat> to accessibility. And from these values, grow the context, the content, and the teaching and learning practices. So there's three perspectives here, very technical, applied educational science, and values-driven, inclusive learning design. So moving on to a case study now. I have the privilege of drawing upon the work undertaken by colleagues at the University of Leeds as a stimulus of my thinking here. And I just want to acknowledge the academic team for our online MSc in Disability Studies, Rights and Inclusion, led by Associate Professor Dr. Han Morgan, Dr. Thomas Campbell, Dr. Mira Griffiths, and Professor Roger Slee, and the original lead learning designers 
who played a pivotal role in exploring the accessibility and inclusive learning design. One of the in the room today. So thank you very much, Izzy, who's now at, Pol uh, at Huddersfield, and Dr. Lauren Mott. In the design of a fully online program of this nature, there were some key pedagog pedagogical choices we wanted to make. And these are captured here. Knowing that this is an online program, how can we be inclusive to a worldwide audience of learners, not necessarily knowing their full context? The academic team had a real strong values-based proposition around inclusive assessment, looking at different formats of access, assessment, giving choice over assessment, whether it's presentation-based or uh, written or other formats. And then also this flexibility of learning content aligned to the different audiences that that programme was going to address. Advocacy of disability rights, those working um, on a certain support context, those working in a legal context, and how the readings and the choice of activists could be amended for those different audiences. And obviously as an online programme, we're going to have discussions about synchronous and asynchronous interaction and the level of discipline pedagogy making sure it's taught at postgraduate level. So those questions form the principles for learning design. Uh, they stem from that value proposition from both the academic and the learning design teams. So if you look at it now from a more technical perspective, an implementation perspective, we've got a very highly skilled learning technology team at the University of Leeds. They're working with our online programmes, conducting rigorous testing of all of our materials. So to complement that, we really wanted to bring in insights from disabled users themselves so we get an authentic experience of what it means to use our platform <laughs> and use our courses so we contracted a company called web usability uh, and prior to the user testing they did a functional test parallel to our internal learning technology team just to make sure that the platform that we had and the activities and the tasks uh, that we set were achievable with assistive technology uh, looking at the functionality of being able to access materials and complete activities, along with, and crucially, the human experience of the online course. So I've got a series of little uh, screenshots which you won't really be able to see, just to give you an impression of there was a course that it was actually in existence and it was tested, um, and some of the quotes that came from the user testing. So in the course of this testing, we learned a lot about the experience of being a disabled student. Uh, within these particular fully online spaces, we're using Blackboard Ultra. Accessibility, as we understood it, started to become more than that technical compliance. And it was only through the user testing that we learned this. Whilst the platform was largely technically accessible, the implementation of courses within the platform introduced barriers, perhaps through unexpected behaviours or even just design choices. Now, none of the implementation here would be outside what would be expected of a professional learning design and course development team. These are the practices that we see everywhere, but yet they were still causing barriers in terms of clicks that had to reveal material or structural aspects to the platform that were not easily identifiable or grouping content together. This is particularly the case with screen reading and screen magnifiers. And even once you're familiar with the operation of the platform, the navigation adds that additional cognitive load and starts to challenge some of the principles of universal design for learning. Further, university level, program level design decisions that lead to templating of these spaces can actually result in some cases of duplication or assessment being hard, or information being hard to find, such as assessment. This is a usability issue, but it becomes an accessibility issue when you have to consider that students with some impairments take extra steps and extra time to navigate these comprehensive course spaces. And that's the type of learning you get when you actually witness users on platforms. Some cases as well, the tool both in-platform and external presented additional challenges due to different action buttons, different language to achieve the same tasks, workflows that weren't transparent, and the, the point here is that in this particular example is about the clarification that something's been submitted to the system and the user expecting some sort of notification to say, yep, okay, you've done everything you, you, know, you should have done, that never happened. So again, this is a usability issue, it becomes accessibility concerns when we think about the additional barriers that disabled students have taken to complete the assessment as well as submit it and using assistive technology to do this as well. 
The other example then is where we switch between platforms, where we switch between tools, we link out to external resources, we link out to other parts of the university. And I'll look at this, the, the underpinning example of this in a bit more detail in a second. So we have some key learning from the accessibility te testing. First of all, that technical compliance is critical to reducing barriers. But it's not the only part of accessibility. Navigation has a massive impact in the way that we structure and lead students through the different online spaces has a massive impact. I think one of the other things to point out, I suppose, is that learners have to complete multiple tasks to even get to learning activities in the first place. Think of, of logging into the VLE. We've also got to consider well, how the students receive that login information. They've got to engage with that login process and that navigation to the course spaces every time they want to be engaged with the online course. And there are additional steps, particularly with disabled users, that they have to take every time. There are a couple of practical aspects as well in terms of our learning in providing accessible alternatives. We do accessible alternatives for everything um, that we need to, but we have these links after the resource, and it's only through the user testing that we realize that probably not the right place to put them. They have to come before the resource because you don't want a learner to go through this resource really complicated, inaccessible, perhaps, and then realize the accessible version is linked beneath it. Um, it's a simple thing, but it's something that technically compliant, but based on user testing, really does work. And again, explaining what expected outcomes should be from using particular tools and different processes. So there are obviously some decisions made here that are beyond the control of the learning designer. We don't get to control how Blackboard designed their platform. We don't get to control the login process of the university. So it's beyond the control of the learning designer, the course developer, or even the academic team. There's a broader context in which our students and we are working. And even with that full technical compliance, adherence to UDL and a highly inclusive, learning design approach, our disabled students are still going to be experiencing online programs within a culture, a context, and an institution that has not been designed the same way. And this is where I bring in systems thinking to help make sense of this broader context. Tannin is a really good case study of, of how systems thinking can be applied to online education. Catch this well in terms of using systems thinking perspective to understand dynamics and challenges to address problems and improve outcomes. So rather than ignoring the bits that we can't control, rather than ignoring this broader context, disclaiming responsibility for it, we have to work consciously within it as learning designers. So here are some really bad visuals that I put together. Um, if we can imagine the system of online education as an interconnected web, of different systems. Some of these would be technical, some of these would be pedagogical. Uh, these systems might start with course marketing right at the beginning, thinking about enrollment processes, application forms, library, the learner experience itself, payments, student support, IT, graduation. They're all interconnected in some way. Each subsystem itself is a mix of processes. And in universities, these are typically developed in isolation from other subprocesses. And that can often lead to disconnection, and it can also often lead to inefficiency. The organizational structure is likely to place an emphasis on data, operational relationships. A change in one subsystem, however, needs consideration of the impacts on another. That's what systems thinking is about. So, for example, when the e the, the library decide that they're no longer going to subscribe to an ebook or that ebook that they have subscribed to is inaccessible. That can have a consequence on the learning design of that course, because we need to be aware of that. Or perhaps the method and speed of application. How accessible are your application forms? We discovered that the R forms aren't, and the way that students had to apply was to ring someone up. It's not really accessible, that. That's not really supporting an international cohort of students where the phone line's nine to five. The speed of that disability service provision as well, in time for that first assessment. Our modules are short, they're quick. Within eight weeks, your first assessment is due in. How does our disability service provide the reasonable adjustments needed in that timeline? 
So a learner is going to have a particular view of the system as well. And those conscious touch points in their learning journey, perhaps more linear than interconnected, but some of the subsystems will be hidden. Uh, a learner is unlikely to know about IT infrastructure or the decision making around BLE platforms or student records, heaven forbid, but they will experience the consequences of those decisions. They'll experience the consequences of those subsystems. So we can start to build a view of this system, which reflects the organizational structures and decisions that also prioritize the student experience. So instead of looking at how data is processed between nodes, instead of uh, how we look at decisions in isolation, we can actually start to reference the student point of view, see the relationships from a student's perspective. Some of those nodes are going to be critical, some of those will be gateways, some of those will be underpinning functions of the system as a whole. And that's the beauty that I found of adopting a systems thinking approach. You start to see the interconnectedness and the dependencies across the whole system. And from a learning design perspective, we can more clearly identify both the technological and the pedagogical interconnections too. So walking through an example, um, let's uh, assume a very basic model of learning activity design. Okay, you've got resources, you've got learners and educators involved, you've got tools, there's this broader context of some sort of learning outcome that they're working towards. Okay, now this example here is a reading task and they're gonna be uh, participating in a discussion activity after they've done some reading. So just follow the structures that a student has to engage with. Right, first of all, we need to go to the VLE. You need the web address of the VLE. You need to go to login, two-factor authentication, of course, and then I get to the VLE homepage. Go to the module homepage, and then from that, I'll be able to find the unit that the task is actually in, and the content page of that unit that's got the link to a library resource, which will be the reading set for this week. Once we go there, we then get bounced to the publisher's web page. Of course, they've got their own navigation structure with a link to the PDF. And finally, we get to the reading that we actually want to engage in with. Oh, oh, and then go back to the VLE to do the discussion task as well. Okay, so this is the structure that we're giving our students to work through. And just going back to the findings from that user testing about that dissonance created when learners have to switch platforms those changes in the platform are highlighted here. There's seven of them. So seven times we were asking a student to learn the navigation, to, to reset their mind in order to complete a simple task of accessing a reading and responding to it on the session board. That's the learner experience of this system. So a slide different view now, showing the relationships and influences. Some of these are actually good. For example, the idea that we've got a single sign-on between the VLE and the library. That's removed one, at least one of those barriers that could be there. But then we also have this sort of publishing copyright system that requires libraries to force students through published sites to find a PDF, rather than to actually simply upload or link directly to the PDF in the VLE. Good old publishing and copyright. So the resource actually sits very separate from the space of learning activity too. There's a missing factor here though. Any guesses? It's the human element. There's a learner involved in this and their device. So this all has to be grounded in the individual student's context. The skills of the learner, to be able to understand this system in the first place, let alone navigate it, the capabilities of the learner, their devices, and their assistive technology. Therefore, one student's experience of this system may be very different from another. And it's this point that's raised a significant challenge in the accessibility of online education. On top of the complexity of the organisational structures, we've got the added complexity and variability of students themselves. And that is not about problematizing students, this is about actually acknowledging that they're part of the system. So knowing that in some cases we know the relationships, but maybe not the detail of the subsystems, the detail of the students' particular circumstances. Drawing upon here from DeSantis and DeSantis, they describe there has to be a level of variability allowed within the system to allow it to function. So they made the point of breaking a system down, taking its component parts outside of the bigger picture, misses the impact of changes across the whole system. It misses the impact in our case of this, the variability of the student in the system. Now let's just take a look at reasonable adjustments. So duty for the Equality Act 2010. If we just have the resources and the mechanisms to do this in an anticipatory way, that's required, it really requires thinking at full institutional level. 
the relationships between student needs, disability services, course production, teaching, and beyond. If we develop courses, say within my team of course design and development, if we develop courses in a particular way, with materials that can only be accessed in one particular format, we are creating values. It leads to a conclusion that as the learner is part of the system, the system has to be adapted to the learner. <laughs> that's an obvious conclusion, but one that's worth surfacing. How we design online education, how we design infrastructure, how we design the processes, the support, the experience has to be adapted. And this is complex. We don't know all the needs in advance. <clears throat> we can never know all the needs of our students in advance, but we can discover and explore these through activities like user testing, student co-creation, design thinking, and use those to service, as Anderson and other analysts describe, emergent properties. And they make a strong case for, for retaining this complexity and consciously engaging with this complexity in order to improve design thinking. So whilst their particular paper was on public self-service design, I think there's a lovely parallel there between the experience that students have in online education. It's not self-service in the same way, but they are self-directed. They're engaging independently with these systems. So there's a really nice parallel between their work and what we do in our online education. So exploring this complexity, <clears throat> the breadth of students, rather than assuming homogeneity, allows us to explore accessibility as a design challenge. We can use this to look at tensions between technology and pedagogy, and we can look at all aspects of accessibility and inclusive education. Now for me, this just feels like the start of the process. I don't have any answers here, but it's just the lens, a way to look at the challenges that we face so that hopefully we can come up with more rich solutions, creative solutions, and hopefully an adaptive educational model. Thank you.